Hey everybody, welcome to Calvary Chapel. Kenny here. We're glad you joined us and we will begin with a word of prayer and then we will get into Nehemiah chapter 9. So uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all the things that you have provided for us, even in all the drama that is happening in our world today, Lord, you are keeping us safe, you are protecting us. And Lord, we are so grateful and thankful for that. So Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would give wisdom to our leaders, that you would give understanding and knowledge to the doctors and the people that are trying to figure out what this virus is and, and put a stop to it. Lord, for our health workers that are, are just exposed to all kinds of things. Lord, protect them. Lord, keep your hand on them. And Lord, we lift them up to you. I know that we even have a few in our church that are at the hospitals and, and really just being wore out from all that's going on. So Lord, we pray that you would do a work. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. And we look forward to what you're going to do in these next few weeks and months of getting through this because lord we know that regardless of what's happening you are still on the throne in jesus name amen hey so when we finished up chapter eight last week um there were some interesting things going on great gladness was brought about because of the obedience of the people every day ezra read from the book of the law and the people were heartbroken because they realized that after reading God's word, their lives weren't matching up to what his word had to say. And they, they really struggled with this and they wondered how in the world did they get so far away from God's word. In chapter eight and verse nine, it says this, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God, do not mourn or weep, for the people wept when they heard the words of the law. But something happened here. Obedience happened. When the people heard the word of God, they decided to change, and they made a choice to be obedient, to keep the feast, to build their booths, and to set apart the last day. And all of this started with obedience. And there was an interesting thing that we read in verse 17 of that chapter. At the very end of that verse, it says, and there was great gladness because here's what they were doing. The seventh month was Tishra. For the Jewish community, three things happened. The Feast of the Trumpets, which started at the first of the month. The Day of Atonement, which was the 10th. And then the Feast of Tabernacles or booze from the 15th to the 21st. And all of that had ended and we know that the wall was completed, and now we're going to start in verse nine, uh, verse, in chapter nine. Sorry, starting in verse one. Now, on the twenty-fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads, and those of the Israelite lineage separated themselves from uh, all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for one fourth of the day. And another fourth of the day, they confessed and worshiped God. You know, in verse one, the people have been convicted by God's word and they are showing humble repentance. And there's three things that we see this with. Assembled with fasting. What they're saying is, listen, we are broken for, for from our sin. So... Food is unimportant to us at this point. And in sackcloth, what they're saying is we're broken by our sins, so normal comforts of life are not important. You know, they were dressing a different way. Dust on their heads. They were throwing dust on their face and on their heads, and this was saying that they were broken by their sin, so the comforts of life are not important. Now, verse 2 says this, So those Israelites... The Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners and they stood and confessed their sin and the iniquities of their fathers. The people of Israel separated themselves from the other people that they were with, stood and confessed their sins. And we understand something. Confession of sin is very, very important. And sometimes we say this. I think we, we give kind of a blanket. We say, Lord, I have sinned today, so please forgive me. But God has clearly called out what sin looks like and what it is. 
And we should clearly confess that sin. Now, sometimes it may be because we're just ashamed of the things we've done and we don't want to repeat them again. But understand the Lord knows. And so we should be honest with him about confessing our specific sins. Because we have sin every day. We know we can't hide anything from the Lord. And you know that you cannot hide anything from the Lord. And there's only one way that we can receive forgiveness and be delivered from this bondage of sin. And God's designed it this way, that we confess it. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, many times I can tell you, I've talked to people that seem to have a continual struggle in their walk with the Lord. It appears to them that God is not even answering their prayers or that they are unsure about what the Lord may even have for them for today or the future. And I want to encourage you today to deal with the sin in your life. Take it to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. Look in God's word and see what he has to say about it what the sin is and how to deal with these circumstances in your life. Get godly counsel and move forward. And we all start with this. We look at things the way the Lord looks at them. Now the word sin, we have to understand uh, that's not a typical word and it's actually an archery term, which means to miss the mark. If you shoot an arrow and you miss the target, you've sinned. And we all have sinned because we missed the target. And sometimes we try really hard to live for Christ, and sometimes we blow it, we mess up, we sin. We're trying to do the right thing, but we miss it. So you may even shoot an arrow intentionally trying to miss the target, and that's still sin. Unconfessed sin is a really, really bad thing. It will bring death. And sometimes we often think that because we've done something and the Lord doesn't strike us dead immediately that he's okay with it or he's overlooked it, but, and we're, we're not struck dead. So we understand, listen, God is just and sin in our lives will bring death and it has all kinds of awful effects that we need to just remove from our lives and all we have to do is ask for forgiveness. Repentance means this, that you are looking at the situation or the sin from God's point of view. You are agreeing with him on the situation or the sin. You were headed in one direction. And because of what the Lord has shown you, you turn around and then start going the other direction. Second Corinthians 7.10 says this, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. One way leads to death and the other way leads to salvation. Choose wisely. Many times people feel sorry for what they've done, often because they were caught or confronted. But listen, this doesn't matter. Sincere confession can bring repentance and it's your choice. Now, the people here, they confess not only the sins, but the sins of their fathers. Now, remember Nehemiah's prayer back in chapter 1, verse 6, he said this, Please let your ear be attentive to, and your eyes opened, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. Now, this was very important because they were admitting that they were sinners and that they came from sin sinful ancestors. Israel was known for glorifying their forefathers. The tradition was passed down about how great their ancestry was, but we have to understand something. They were all guilty of sin. Now, if you remember back in Matthew chapter 3, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came out to the Jordan River to see John, and he was preaching and baptizing. And John says something interesting to him. He says in verse 9 and 10, he says, Do not think to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as a father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. 
and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. Listen, Abraham will not save them. And the, the people had an arrogance and a pride that was shown from these Jewish leaders in this instance because they thought they were okay because they were descendants of Abraham. People today even think that way. They think because they go to church or they do some awesome work or, or something really, really good that, that that makes things okay with God. And it's not. Please remember, Jesus said some really harsh words that are very convicting in Matthew 7. You know, people came to him and they said, hey, I did all this stuff for you. He says, people are going to come to him in the judgment. And they, they're going to say all these wonderful things that they've done. And Jesus says, let's depart from me. I never had a relationship with you. I never knew you. So we need to be very careful. We cannot look at things the way the world looks at them. We can't look at things the way we look at them. We have to look at things the way God's word looks at them. And that is to confess our sins. So in verse 3, Nehemiah 9. They stood up in their place and they read from the book of the law of their Lord, their God, one fourth of the day. And the other fourth of the day, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Now, they didn't just stop with a few things as they read. They kept reading, and they wanted to know more about God. And as they read, they confessed and worshiped. Could it be that sometimes we neglect the Word of God because we might read something that we uh, need to change in our lives and we really don't want to change it? That might be something that we need to confess. Something that needs to be laid before the throne of God so that we can worship God instead of our sin. Listen, idolatry is a very hard thing to understand because we don't carve out little idols and put them on our mantle or on our dresser and, and worship them. But we do in the sense of when we put things before the Lord. And there are sometimes we put sin before the Lord and we will not address it the way the Lord wants to address it. Charles Spurgeon said this, Repentance grows as faith grows. Do not make any mistake about it. Repentance is not a thing of days and weeks or a temporary penance to be gotten over as fast as possible. No, it is the grace of a lifetime like faith itself. Repentance is insep an inseparable companion of faith. David Gusick said this, he said, this great humble gathering of God's people took place only two days after the end of a joyful celebration and the Feast of Tabernacles. They had drawn so close to God and now God was even drawing closer to them. It's amazing how God's word works that way, isn't it? Now we have two verses. The next two verses are about some guys that stood on some stairs. Uh, they cried with a loud voice and they were ready to lead in a prayer. Maybe the longest prayer in the Bible. Now, if someone wants to time it and read it, please message me and tell me how long it took you to read it. I haven't timed it, but uh, before we recite it, I want we read it, I want to look at a few things. And I would ask you to write these down. I'll go slowly. God's word will literally speak to you. And we're going to read a prayer that these guys prayed, that they cried out to the Lord, and there's some interesting things. I, I wrote down 18 things, so let's slowly go through them. Number one, we learn about praise. Number two, we learn about worship. Number three, we learn about God's power. Number four, God's provision. Number five, God's instruction. Number six, God's mercy. Number seven, God's character. Number eight, God's patience. Number nine, God's wisdom. Number 10, God's promises. Number 11, God's justice. Number 12, God's forgiveness. Number 13, God's mercy. 
Number 14, God's grace. Number 15, God's faithfulness. And number 16, confession. Number 17, humility. And number 18, commitment. So let's read together. Please open your Bible and read along with me. Nehemiah chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 5 and read to the end of the chapter. The end of verse 9, he says, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heavens of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all, the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and you gave him the name Abraham, and you found his heart faithful before you. And made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words. You are righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, Egypt and heard the cry of the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh against all his servants, against all the people of his land. And you, grew, you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And their persecutors, you threw them into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day by a pillar a cloudy pillar, and by night by a pillar of fire to give them light on the road in which they should travel. You came down also to Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven, and you gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws. By the hand of Moses, your servant, you gave them bread for, from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go and to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. But they, our fathers, acted proudly. They hardened their necks and they did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they did harden their necks, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and you did not forsake them. Even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God, and you brought them up, that brought them up out of Egypt, and work great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor did the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave good your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold manna from their mouths. And you gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. And they took possession of the land of Shion and the land of the king of Hezbron and the land of Og and king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go in and possess. So the people went in and possessed the land. You subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and you gave into their hands with their kings and the people of their land that they might do with them as they wished. 
and they took strong cities and rich land, and they possessed houses full of all goods, cisterns already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and they were filled and grew fat, and they delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and they rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs, and they killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself, and they worked great provocations. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. And in time of trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven, and according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers to save them from the hand of their enemies. But after that, they rest. They again did evil before you. Therefore, you left them in the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried out to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies and testified against them that you might bring them back to your law. Yet they acted proudly and they did not heed your commandments but they sinned against your judgments, which is which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they shrugged their shoulders, stiffened their necks, and they would not hear. Yet for many years you had patience with them and testified against them by your spirit and your prophets, and yet they would not listen. Therefore you gave them to the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them for, for, or forsake them, for you are God, gracious and merciful. Now, therefore, our God, the great and mighty, awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy, do not let all the trouble seem small before you that has come upon us, our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all of your people. From this day, from the days of the kings of Assyria until this day, However, you are just in all that has befallen us, and you have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Neither our kings, nor our princes, nor our priests, nor our fathers have kept your law, nor heeded your commandments or your testimonies, with which you testified against them. For they have not served you in their kingdom, or in the many good things that you gave them, or in the large or rich land which you set before them, nor did they turn from their wicked works. But here we are, servants today, and the land that you gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its bounty, here we are, servants in it. And it yields much increase to the kings who you have set over us. Because of our sins, also they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. Now, I know that in reading that, it may have been long, but here's what I do know. The Holy Spirit spoke to you. And you must be convinced that the Lord loves you. He has never promised to change our circumstances. But what he has promised is to change us, to change you. God loves you and he wants so much for you to live a successful life in him. Not by the world's standards, but by his. Now this prayer is a bit of history lesson for us as well. And I pray for you that it doesn't end with doubt and disobedience, but with strength and obedience, trusting in Jesus. Listen, there have been wars, natural catastrophes, plagues and famines all in our lifetime. And we are now even dealing with something that is just unprecedented. But I want to remind you, God is on the throne. Now, there's an amazing thing that happened in this chapter. God's word was changing people. It happened then, and it has been happening, and it is still happening today. And I want to leave you with a few verses 
that I really hope that considering all the things that have been happening the past few days, that these will encourage you in the Lord and understand how much the Lord loves you. James 1, verses 2 through 4, he says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Deuteronomy 31.6 says this, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear to be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 27, 1 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength, of, the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid of? And then one last one. Please turn in your Bible to Psalm chapter 56. Now this is not near as long as this area in, in, Jeremiah, or in Nehemiah that we have read. David writes, Be merciful to me, O God, for a man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All the days they twist my words and their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps when they lie in wait for my life. Shall they escape by iniquity in anger cast down the people, O God? You number my wanderings. You put my tears in your bottle. Are they not all written in your book? When I cry to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God, and I will render praises to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Listen, this is some interesting things that we are going through in this day and age. And I want you to encourage you, listen, no matter what happens, you need to let the Lord be your strength. Now, as Calvary Plymouth, if, if there's anything out there that we can do for you, will you please email us at calvaryplymouth at gmail.com or message us here on, on Facebook and we will get back to you and we will try to help you the best that we can and, and, and just pray and work through these things. Tune in on Facebook also for sun, Sunday at 1030 uh, as we will continue our study through Colossians. Listen, we love you and the leadership of Calvary Chapel is praying for you. God bless you and have a great night.